Hello, people of Earth. Well, I have some uh, good news and some bad news. I'm going to start with the bad news. We all think of this place as our permanent home, but it actually cannot be that. Um, this planet doesn't care if we survive or not, and it's a lot tougher than we are. That's why our place on this planet is hardly guaranteed. So consider this, 99% of all the species that have ever lived on Earth have gone the way of this guy, the woolly mammoth, a magnificent creature. In species time, he had a great run, 1,600 years. That's pretty good. We, Homo sapiens, have been on Earth for 300,000 years, and it might be time that we're running out of luck. There are a lot of reasons we can't survive here permanently, and if nothing else ever gets us, our sun will eventually begin to expand, and either it will throw Earth entirely out of its orbit as it does this, which is a normal consequence of what happens to stars, or it will consume us in a fireball of radiation, and nothing will be alive on this planet. And in the meantime, we live in kind of a dream world, as if we aren't actually threatened by dozens of extinction events. And let's look at a few of them. Take, for example, tiny life forms we can't even see without magnification, viruses. This one is H1N1. That's the original flu virus that caused the last disastrous worldwide pandemic back in 1918. It was called the Spanish flu, despite the fact that it originated in New Jersey. Um, and a third of all the people in the world were infected by it and it killed 100 million. The Spanish flu came in three waves or mutations, but it's the second wave that's important because that wave, that mutation was 100% fatal. If you got that version of the flu, you died, no ifs, ands, or buts. And it's only a matter of time, the Centers for Disease Control will tell you, before another deadly flu like this emerges again. And it could be this one. H7N9, it's an avian flu. So far, a few hundred people in China who handle chickens a lot and get the blood on their hands and maybe a cut on their hands have died from this. The CDC considers it the prime candidate for the next worldwide pandemic. Now, this bug is not easily transmissible to humans yet, but the CDC worries that it will eventually join forces with an ordinary flu virus. And the result of that is called a recombinant virus. And it happens when a deadly bug like H7N9 that normally stays in animals happens to get into someone who already is infected with a common flu. Then those two viruses nestle up against each other and they trade genes. They form a new super virus that easily moves from person to person. And we have not one single cure for any virus on this planet. We have no vaccines for the scariest ones, and new ones lurk everywhere. About a decade ago, Craig Venter, the guy who decoded the human genome, sailed around the world in his yacht, Sorcerer 2, and every few days he collected some seawater and sent it back to his labs in Maryland. In every liter of seawater, they found a minimum of a million previously unknown viruses. Okay, so let's move from the little to the big. Our sun spits out huge bursts of atomic particles called coronal mass ejections about four times every 24 hours. They're deadly, but they almost always miss us. And, uh, and to understand why, you have to think of the sun as a basketball, and then think of the earth as a BB. And now move that BB a mile away from the sun for the relative distance that we are from it. We're a very small target for a coronal mass ejection because the sun is a sphere and can shoot its stuff out in thousands of different directions. But that's not to say we haven't been warned. In 1859, a coronal mass ejection destroyed the new US telegraph system. Almost all the wires in that system melted, causing hundreds of fires. And many operators had their keys on the telegraph key, or their finger on the telegraph key, were shocked unconscious. We can live through these eruptions thanks to our protective magnetosphere, a magnetic field around the Earth created by its spinning molten iron core. Where Earth is kind of a generator, essentially. 
but a direct hit would kick us on our ear, taking the power grid out and every satellite in orbit and plunge us into a 19th century existence without electricity or communications. No cell phones, no ATMs. Imagine trying to replace every telephone wire, every power line, every internet cable, every server, every computer. The trucks that we depend upon for food distribution simply wouldn't start, nor would tractors in agricultural fields. There's a three-day supply of food in America's grocery stores. Most cities would become uninhabitable within a week, and 50% of the population would be homeless. Okay, first thing I'll admit is that a solar flare can't actually wipe out the human species. So how about this? We now know by studying other G2 stars, which is the kind of star that our sun is, that they tend to brighten by about 2% every 50 million years. That means a blast of particles and radiation that would destroy our atmosphere. Here you're looking at a synthetic genome invented nine years ago and inserted into a bacterial cell to create a new life form that never before existed on the Earth. That was an amazing leap, but that was nine years ago. Very soon, most high school students will have access to the equipment that will allow them to create new life forms. And the goal is noble. Control what a cell does and you can make it do almost anything. You can throw it down an oil well and it'll eat the oil and it'll, uh, as a waste product, give you methane. Um, you can make synthetic vaccines with them and we might need those. You can make synthetic medicines. or you can even take CO2 and turn it into a usable fuel with the right kind of new life forms on Earth. What could possibly go wrong? Well, think of smallpox, Ebola, and the N7H9 flu I just talked about, and combine those together in one virus on purpose. Now think of suicidal terrorists who are dissatisfied with killing only a few hundred people at once. In the wrong hands, a superbug like that could spread around the world and kill every human. More, more bad news. Now let's look at artificial intelligence. And that's the Curiosity rover on Mars. It's an incredible machine, but it can't think. The new rover we send to Mars next year with will have artificial intelligence aboard. And that's because Curiosity takes 48 hours to do what a human can do in two hours. Um, if we see a rock in front of Curiosity, like you see here, um, controllers on Earth have to design software to tell it what to do. I mean, the transmission of the message from the signal about the rock to Earth, and then if the, if, forget how long it takes to write the software, that's a couple of days, but then to send it back, that round trip is 45 minutes alone. This rover has been on Mars for seven years and traveled 13 miles. Now, an AI version of the Curiosity rover could make its own critical decisions in real time, and that is going to be an absolutely brilliant advance. But wait, doesn't that mean we can build killer drones that make their own decisions? It does. And I leave you this, with this one thought about artificial intelligence that Stephen Hawking actually foresaw. The one thing that AI can do better than anything else right now in 2019 is it can track the movements of every human on Earth every minute of every day. Just ask China. One thing a superintelligence can't control is our unstable planet, not, be far, not far below our feet. Um, everything is essentially molten goo. The Earth's crust is only five miles deep beneath the oceans, and it's only 25 miles deep under the United States, and everything else is, forms most of the Earth is basically lava. And it often breaks through the crust. The biggest extinction events in Earth's history have been caused by supervolcanism. The entire subcontinent of India was formed when the Earth opened up and lava flowed out for centuries. Volcanic activity can send so much ash into the atmosphere that it mimics the aftermath of a nuclear war. And just one volcano can threaten worldwide starvation. In 1815, Mount Tambora in Indonesia blew its top. It was followed by something called the year without summer. 
Snow fell throughout New England in July and August, and frosts were common all across the United States all summer. People in North America and Europe rioted because food prices quadrupled. And there's another unstable heat source we have to worry about, which you, which you probably know all about, which is CO2. Just over 30 years ago, the mean, and that was just 30 years ago, the mean atmospheric temperature on Earth was 14 and a half degrees centigrade. It's gone up a full degree since then. Scientists say if we go up another degree, Earth's climate will go haywire, as if it hasn't started already. And all five of the biggest extinctions in Earth's history have been characterized by rapid increases in CO2. And despite the Kyoto Accords, CO2 levels continue to go up. Crop yields around the world have been going up for 40 years. They're now starting to level off, and soon they will decline. And you can see this in the wave of immigrants who are coming to the United States from Central America, because coffee plantations in Central America, due to changes in climate, are failing left and right. And things could get a lot worse. A four degree rise in temperatures, which is much more likely than the two degree rise we hope for, could actually cut the US production of corn in half. And if CO2 levels get fairly high, we get maybe a nine degree rise in temperature, we'll, our brains will no longer get enough oxygen and we'll lose cognitive ability. But by then we'll have artificial intelligence to fall back on. Now, we all know about the horrors of nuclear war, but most people only think about war between superpowers, which so far have shown themselves to know better. There's a larger potential threat that's far from the control, far from our control on the Indian subcontinent. Both India and Pakistan have about 150 nuclear warheads. Uh, this video is not running. There we go. Both India and Pakistan have about 150 nuclear warheads. They're adding to that by about 20 warheads a year. And both countries have a triad delivery system for their nukes now, uh, land, sea, and air. Both Pakistan and India are building nuclear submarines. Both countries are increasing their nukes every year, and both are developing MIRV warheads. An all-out exchange between these two countries would create a nuclear winner that kills everyone on Earth. Finally, there's an asteroid problem. There are about 100 million of them out there. And right now in our solar system, somewhere in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, or in the Kuiper belt that's far beyond Pluto, there's a large asteroid with our name on it. A seven mile wide asteroid took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago when it created firestorms across the planet and a winter that lasted hundreds of years. Nothing larger than a rabbit survived. What we face is not a matter of if this happens again, it's only a matter of when. There are tens of thousands of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter that could destroy life on Earth. Hundreds of them are 60 miles across. And there are 10,000 objects called near-Earth asteroids that interact with Earth's gravity and actually travel around the sun with us. This is a look at what a satellite has seen recently. All those gray dots are asteroids. The yellow ones are comets. The green ones are near-Earth asteroids. That's a lot of trouble. One day you could wake up and read a headline that says, large asteroids sighted on collision course with Earth. And if we haven't built a redundant system to knock it out, it will be too late to actually build that system and fire it off at that incoming. And what happens after that is kind of beyond horror because most humans won't die when the impact occurs. They'll die of starvation. Now NASA is working on this, but it's really slow progress. This is DART, the double asteroid redirection test. It's an attempt to use blunt force to see if we can change the course of an incoming asteroid. We're sending a spacecraft the size of a car to smash into this little asteroid, one that would, would do what we call regional damage, at 13,500 miles an hour. We hope it will shift the course of this asteroid by four-tenths of a millimeter per second. That's about 100 feet a day. And even if it works, 
we will have to identify a dangerous asteroid at least five years before it heads our way, and that's rather unlikely. Now the good news. All of these threats to the continuation of humans on Earth argue strongly for developing an ability to be a multi-planet species. And think about this for a minute. For 95% of our history, humans have been nomads who reached out beyond the next horizon and into the wilderness. They learned that moving on was a matter of survival. Homo sapiens, have, as I've said before, have been around for about 300,000 years, but we only started staying in one place 20,000 years ago, grouping together in towns and growing crops and domesticating animals. Moving on may be built into our DNA, and I don't think we should fight it. Our immediate goal should be to go here. If we can learn to build a city on Mars that's self-sustaining, we can learn how to become a spacefaring species that eventually travels far beyond Mars and far beyond our solar system. And I'm not talking about a few astronauts going to Mars, picking up some rocks and heading home. I'm talking about millions of people living on that planet and far sooner than you would think. It won't be easy because Mars isn't as much like Earth as we like to think it is. For starters, the atmosphere is super thin, about 100 times thinner than Earth's, and it's 96% carbon dioxide. When we breathe more than about 5% carbon dioxide, and you can practice this with a, with a paper bag, we pass out. It's also cold on Mars. The average temperature is minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit, but that doesn't actually represent real temperatures because it can get as high as 70 degrees at the equator on a nice day on Mars in the summer, but that same night, the temperature could plunge to minus 100. And gravity on Mars is far less than it is on Earth because, and in fact, the, the fact that gravity on Mars is 38% Earth's gravity tells you exactly what size Mars is. It's 38% the size of Earth. So on Mars, you can do really cool things like jump over your car rather than walk around it. And if the atmosphere were a little thinner, you could kind of put on bat wings and you could take a jump and you could probably fly a couple hundred feet. But we actually have little understanding how we'll react to low gravity over a long period of time. We've just discovered, for example, that zero gravity on the International Space Station for extended periods will cause human eyesight harm permanently. And Mars is a long way away. The moon is 250,000 miles away from us. It took Apollo astronauts three days to get there. Mars is 1,000 times farther away than the moon. And despite what you hear about some optimistic projections of how long it will take us to get there, it will probably take eight months. Despite our successes with recent rovers to Mars, our record of getting to the red planet isn't so great. Uh, we've sent more, Earthlings have sent more than 50 missions to Mars, and two-thirds of them missed or crashed. So this isn't easy to get there, but it is doable. And that brings up an interesting question. How soon will the first humans actually set foot on the red planet? Now, NASA says it should be able to land humans on Mars in the 2040s. And I think that's true. But that will be a little capsule with seven guys in it. NASA definitely should be able to put people into orbit around Mars sometime in the mid-2030s. But frankly, I don't think they'll bother because I think people will already be there. And that's because this guy is determined to make it happen. That's Elon Musk, and he's the CEO of two companies that are obviously changing the world, Tesla Motor Cars and SpaceX. His rocket company has one mission and one mission only. That's it build a self-sustaining city on Mars of at least a million people. And everything this company decides to do from day to day, month to month, year to year, is based on that mission statement. That's why a lot of people are working there instead of at NASA. Musk thinks SpaceX will land humans on Mars by 2024, perhaps 2025. And just three years from now, in 2022, they will attempt two huge cargo landings on Mars. Here's some footage from the National Geographic documentary series we shot. Um, this is kind of outtakes before the first Falcon Heavy rocket was actually launched last year. Well, maybe not. Elon, in our lifetimes, yeah. where will SpaceX take us or all humans? 
I'm very hopeful that humanity will have a base on the moon and a city on Mars in our lifetimes. In our lifetimes? Yes. Yes. Well, hopefully a Falcon Heavy will really inspire people to think about Mars. Because, you know, there's all these defensive reasons of like we want to be a multi planet species and, and having a life insurance policy in case something bad happens to Earth. But I personally don't find that nearly as motivating as the excitement of being a space-faring civilization and being a multi planet species and getting out there among the stars and seeing what the universe is all about. But I find it incredibly inspiring. Now here's the point. Governments and their robots and we must always be super safe attitudes no longer control the space game. Private companies are making space a huge business and before long they'll be happy to take you to Mars. Every year Jeff Bezos sells a billion dollars worth of his Amazon stock to build a new rocket company called Blue Origin and remember that Musk started his rocket company with only three million bucks, 300 million bucks. Now, here's what Bezos has been doing with some of that money. This is the first time this rocket has ever launched. That's Mackenzie out front. Main engine coming up. Show confirms operation. Booster confirms. That's a capsule. Apogee, 304,000 feet. CC Apogee, 307. That's a capsule that would carry three humans. Drop the plane. Main parachute to plane. Now, that's really a very expensive amusement park ride designed to take three space tourists up about 60 miles, although this rocket was used in January to launch eight very small uh, satellites into, into low Earth orbit. But Bezos is building a much bigger rocket called New Glenn, and it's bigger than Elon Musk's Falcon 9, and it's even bigger than the Falcon Heavy. We are witnessing a weird competition among billionaires to see whose rocket is biggest. <laughs> <clears throat> and there are a lot of players. Sir Richard Branson's Spaceship 2 flew to the edge of space three months ago, 56 miles up. In July, he intends to be the first passenger. Virgin Galactic is building two more of these ships. Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, who died last October, had developed an air-based rocket launch system called Stratolaunch. It hurls a rocket from below the world's largest airplane. This thing is two 747s, re-engineered and fit together by aerospace genius designer Bert Rutan. 
This, sent, this system can send um, a satellite as far as the moon. And this aircraft made its maiden flight only last month. And this is Peter Diamandis' company in Se Seattle. Um, it mines asteroids. And there's a lot of Google money invested here too. The mission of Planetary Resources is to expand the economic sphere of influence of humanity into the solar system. And that's a big goal, but one that's achievable through the pursuit and development of resources in space to enable not only the further exploration and development of space, but the benefit of the economy right back here at Earth. And when we looked at what were the most accessible resources of the 100 million asteroids in the solar system, there's about 1% that are energetically very favorable, meaning they're easy to get to and easy to get back from. And so it also turns out that those near-Earth asteroids are chock full of fuels and precious metals and industrial metals. The very first resource that's the key to opening up space is the simple molecule of water. And we know that H2O is very plentiful on near-Earth asteroids. We know that our long-term goal to prospect and mine asteroids is audacious. Today, behind me is the completed ARCID-6 satellite, destined for its mission later this year. Each of these satellites is a strong step forward towards the ultimate goal of prospecting and mining resources in space. We want to know if water is there. We want to know if iron is there. We want to know the nature of those resources. Everything we've held of value on Earth, metals, minerals, energy, real estate, fuels, those are out there in vast quantity. We are going to be the company that knows the most information about the potential asteroids of high value out there. We are going after the greatest gold rush ever. The most valuable thing planetary resources are looking for is water, and here's why. And when you split the water molecule, you get hydrogen and oxygen. And those just happen to be the most common fuels for rockets that we know of. And oxygen will also keep people alive in space. But space isn't just a big business, it's world politics now, and NASA's budget is in decline. Meanwhile, the Chinese and the Russians' investments in space are actually increasing. We cooperate with the Russians on the International Space Station, as well as the Japanese, the Canadians, and 11 European countries, but we don't let the Chinese in for security reasons. So, they built their own space program. Two months ago, they landed a rover on the dark side of the moon. That's never been done before. And they will launch their own space station in 2022, and they will go to Mars. And Vladimir Putin is also very serious about a race to Mars. There's kind of an interesting story most people don't know, which is when Kennedy announced that we were going to do a moonshot, the head of the uh, Soviet space program at the time went to Nikita Khrushchev and said, you know, we can beat the Americans. And Chris just said, to the moon? And he said, no, we can go to Mars. And they probably could have. The technology for doing this is that old. No modern nation that wants to get to Mars will have a problem doing it. For example, the United Arab Emirates will launch a lander to Mars next year. So this is a doable proposition, and we have had the technology for about 40 years to do it. But staying alive on Mars is another story. Now, NASA may not be the first to land people on Mars, but it does know how to keep them alive once they get there. Let's look at the problem this way. You need food, water, shelter, and clothing to live on Earth, and you need oxygen as well to live on Mars. And as I've said before, the most important item is water. It's the basis of all life forms that we know of. But it weighs eight pounds a gallon, and it costs more than 12,000 bucks to take a gallon of water to Mars from Earth. So we have to find it on a planet that looks a lot like the deserts in Colorado and Utah. And fortunately, Mars isn't actually like that. The soil is, or the surface of Mars is very dusty, but it contains up to 60% water in the form of ice. Orbiters have shown us, and that is a real photograph, that lots of craters on this planet have ice in them. This is the Korolev crater in the northern hemisphere. It's 50 miles across and a couple thousand feet deep. The six active satellites that are, search that are circling Mars right now 
also tell us there are huge glaciers of ice on Mars. And last year, Italian scientists revealed an underground lake on Mars of liquid water. There are probably many more of these. And if all, if all the surface ice on Mars were to melt, the planet would be 300 feet deep in water. But digging up this ice and melting it requires huge equipment and lots of energy. So this is how we'll have water when we want it, at least in the beginning. A device cooked up at the University of Washington back in 1998 called WAVAR. Your HVAC guy would call it a dehumidifier. It only has one moving part. And it can extract plenty of water from the Mars atmosphere because every night, because of the cooling of the atmosphere on Mars, the atmosphere turns just about 100% humid. And the next critical need for survival on Mars is oxygen. And for that, I introduce you to MIT scientist Michael Hecht. Now, Dr. Hecht has developed a machine called MOXIE, and that stands for Moxi Mars Oxygen in C2 Resource Utilization Experiment. I think I got that right. But it basically, it's a reverse, it's a kind of a reverse fuel cell, and it can take in the Martian atmosphere, separate off the carbon atom, and leave you with pure oxygen. And uh, a CO2 molecule is 78% oxygen once you take off the carbon. Next year, NASA will send an entirely new rover to Mars, as I've mentioned, and the MOXIE device will be aboard, and it will produce enough oxygen to keep one person alive indefinitely. But that's just for testing. NASA intends to build a version of MOXIE that's 100 times bigger and will send it to Mars within the next six years. And they will also send storage tanks. And then this huge MOXIE device will fill those storage tanks with liquid oxygen for future landers to be used both as a fuel for return flights and to keep people alive on the planet. Now, what about food? Uh, we will use hydroponics and aeroponics to grow some food on Mars, but it's really tricky to do this in a greenhouse on Mars for a lot of different reasons. So we probably won't grow more than 20% of our caloric intake on Mars, at least not until we can make liquid water flow on the planet and we can actually grow crops outdoors, and I will get to that. In the meantime, food will have to arrive from Earth, dried. And then there's shelter. At first, we can use inflatable pressurized buildings, but radiation is a huge problem, and you need some pretty thick walls between you and the radiation on Mars. Fortunately, the Martian soil is kind of ideal for making bricks, and NASA's engineers to the rescue, they figured out how to throw a little polymer into the soil and make a form and throw it into a microwave oven, and out pops a brick. Or maybe we'll live here in a partially underground dome designed by architect Bjarke Ingels, that is actually being built in the desert of the United Arab Emirates as a test for their Mars colony. The inflated plastic dome could actually be filled with water to help block radiation. You only need about a meter of water. Um, buildings inside the dome descend into the Martian soil, offering increasing protection from radiation the deeper you go. And these are buildings that architect Norman Foster designed. Uh, they're 3D printed from the Martian soil, and they can be built, they were designed to be built by robots before humans even get there. They're kind of the uh, bulk attempt at building buildings. And finally, there's clothing. On Earth, you always have 15 pounds of the atmosphere pressing down on you at all times, and your body is actually designed to push out against that. On Mars, as we've mentioned, there's very little atmospheric pressure. So without a spacesuit, you would start expanding and look like the Michelin Man pretty soon. But Davin Newman, a scientist from MIT, has created a sleek, lightweight spacesuit that looks more like an exercise outfit. It keeps you together, it blocks radiation, and it keeps you warm. It has a lot of metallic fibers in it. That's her modeling it. So food, water, shelter, clothing, oxygen, we can do this. And that leads us to the next logical step in the good life on Mars, terraforming the planet to make it more like Earth. To do that, we have to warm it up. Mars is cold, again, because of that very thin atmosphere. And the answer lies here at the South Pole, which is covered in frozen carbon dioxide, dry ice. It's just barely frozen. It's just cold enough to, 
to turn into a crystal. If we heat it up just a few degrees, that dry ice will sublime directly into a gas just as it does on Earth. And as we know, nothing is quite as good at creating a greenhouse effect as good old CO2. And my favorite proposal to heat it up is a highly reflective solar sail in orbit around Mars so that it focuses the sun's rays on the South Pole 24-7. Within as little as 20 years, the temperatures on Mars would actually begin rising. And before long, surface ice, at least near the equator, would melt, and that would add water vapor to the atmosphere, and water vapor is actually a very good greenhouse gas. As the atmosphere thickens, everything would get better. We'd get more protection from radiation, and more atmosphere would trap more heat, which would create more water vapor going in the air, which would trap more heat, etc. And within a few decades, you would have streams and lakes on, on Mars, probably within 20 degrees north of the equator and 20 degrees south of the equator. And then we could actually grow crops outdoors. Clouds would form and it would rain on Mars. And eventually, some of the planet could be made to feel a lot like southern Canada. We'd still be left with a complicated problem, and it is a complicated problem, of making the atmosphere breathable. That could take hundreds of years. But humans are smart and remarkably adaptable. Remember that there were no airplanes 120 years ago. There's also no telling how quickly genetics could help us. We're actually on the edge of mastering our own genetics in real time, being able to change genes in your own body in real time. So we could end up with one species of human on Earth and a completely different species of human on Mars that is more genetically adapted to its challenges. So I asked you how long it would be before people would land on Mars. You probably thought it was crazy that people might land within six years. But what if I told you there will be 50,000 people on Mars by 2050? Think back to when the first colonists arrived in the Americas from England. The Mayflower was one ship with 102 passengers. 30 years later, Boston was a city. In 1620, one ship sails to America from Britain. 20 years later, 700 ships come in one summer. SpaceX is actually already building its Mars rocket. It's built the fuel tanks for three Mar rockets so far. Uh, they used to call this rocket the BFR, and now they have a more subtle name for it. Starship. <clears throat> it will have two stages. The second stage, which you see here, is permanently attached to a spaceship. This will be three times more powerful and far larger than any rocket ever built, approximately 32 feet across. The reusable first stage will return to Earth after providing an initial boost, and then the second stage that's built into the spaceship will get it up to Earth orbit. There, it will dock with a tanker. That tanker will have been brought up by those reusable boosters. It will refuel, and then it will head to Mars. And there will be 80 to 100 people aboard. By 2030, SpaceX will probably have a few dozen of these rockets, and will be sending them to Mars every two years when the planets align just right. But by 2050, Elon Musk envisions that he will have built 1,000 of these ships and that they will leave all at once, every two years, for Mars. That's 80,000 people in a single trip. So, what will all this mean? It will mean that anyone with about $400,000 in his pocket who wants to start over can buy a one-way ticket from SpaceX and go to Mars. But when humans do land on Mars for the first time, and that may be five years from now, it will be the most significant event in our history. And I think it will be the most inspiring. I'll let Musk explain. Life cannot just be about solving one miserable problem after another. They, they have to be reasons that, that you, where you wake up in the morning and you look forward to being alive. You're excited about the future. <laughs> That's, I think, what Mars represents most to me. It's seeing what the universe is all about. Now, there's one additional question that I have, which is where we go after Mars, because Mars is not a permanent solution to the extinction of humans in this solar system. And, but at the current rate that our knowledge is accelerating, I'll give you three ideas of things I think will happen by 2050. 
First, I think we will discover life in our solar system. Maybe on Mars, but probably not. Maybe on Europa. Once we do, we will know that life in the universe is ubiquitous. Second, we'll discover another Earth-like planet that is not too distant to travel to, even though it might be in another galaxy or, or in another star system, say within a third of a human lifetime. And finally, we'll vastly improve our ability to travel efficiently both within and outside our solar system. You're looking at a map by Dr. Martin Lowe at the Jet Propulsion Lab. It shows gravitational freeways for spacecraft that exist in our solar system. You can travel these without any rocket fuel. They, these, pathway, these tunnels require virtually no energy to travel between planets. So we will figure out how to become a spacefaring species. Thank you.